ASEAN Dailies. First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Good morning, this is Arlene and you're with uh, us on Durian ASEAN where we bring you an uh, interesting discussion on Southeast Asia. I'm going to start off with ASEAN Daily, our news commentary on Southeast Asia where we bring you all the latest news and all the latest commentaries from us. So, the first stop is the PAP. Uh, op- and also opposition candidates They traded words over cost of living and immigration issues I'm talking about the debate uh, That went live in Singapore's uh, television On the upcoming general election Where Media Corp had a one hour forum teles- telecast l- telecasted live so a lot of the issues were being discussed of course uh, that the issues regarding on cost of living on immigration became one of the key subjects uh, of debate among candidates from the ruling and opposition parties and what is interesting is representatives from the People Action Parties and five opposition parties fielding the most number of candidates for general elections 2015 were gathered at Media Corp for the structured forum titled Your Vote Matters was simulcast on Channel 5 and Channel News Asia from 8pm to 9pm. The panel comprises of Mr. Comprise of Mr. Lawrence Wong and Miss Denise Poir from the PAP, which is contesting all 89 seats. Mr. Pereira, Leon Anil, workers from the Workers' Party, 28 seats. Mr. Lim Tin, a National Solidarity Party, 12 seats. Mr. Kenneth uh, Jayan Ratnam, reform part from the Reform Party, eleven uh, contesting eleven seats. Doctor Chi Su Juan, Singapore Democratic Party, contesting eleven seats, and Mr. Tan Ji Se from the P- Singaporeans First uh, Party, where he contested ten seats. So on the issue of rising cost of living. In a question and answer segment, candidates tackle the top three questions sent by viewers. And, uh, are they able to keep the cost of living manageable? Mr. Lim said that NSP recognizes the huge inequality gap in Singapore, one of the highest in the world. And Singapore is also one of the most expensive city in the world, as we all know. It has unveiled a policy to allow every Singapore family that does not live in private property to buy a HDB flat at cost plus and also another on the resale market. More could be done to keep incomes growing and to give citizens more security in their retirement, say Mr. Pereira. He pointed to recommendations in the WP manifesto for inflation pack silver support payouts, lowering BTO flat prices and unemployment insurance. While on the other hand, Mr. J. Ratnam say, Sing- said Singapore wages were being depressed by the government's open door policy and the RP wanted a cap on the number of foreign workers and, of course, a minimum wage. On the other hand, Mr. Tan blamed rising costs mainly on government measures in transport, housing and education. It has very little to do with imported inflation as in the past oil prices have come down and yet petrol prices have risen because the government has increased the duty on petrol uh, on petrol sorry. And and he He's definitely widening the scope of why the rising cost of uh, is is not necessary just uh, external uh, reasons. Well, Dr. Chi, on the other hand, said that bringing in the super rich was driving up prices of houses and cars, while at the same time imported low wage. PMETs depressed salaries and made for a double whammy. But Ms. P- 
Hua pointed out that there were there were service jobs such as nursing that Singaporeans shunned, and businesses were already feeling the impact of a tightened inflow of foreigners. Also responding, Mr. Wong pointed out that in fact not just nominal wages but also real wages, which account for inflation, have increased, and they will continue to do their best to keep essential services affordable. Education in Singapore is heavily subsidized. In fact, more hawker centers are being built, and electricity prices today are lower than in 2010. On top of that, families are getting more U-safe rebates than before. In fact, the government is doing more and wants to continue doing more. This is according to representatives from PAP. We are open to new ideas on a minimum wage. We have to be careful. If done incorrectly, it can lead to more unemployment and worse outcomes for Singapore. Singapore's neoliberal-leaning economic system does uh, create a bit of uncertainty in whether they want to implement a minimum wage or not. But with the rising cost of living, a minimum wage might be the way forward from what is being seen here. And the future of Singapore politics, uh, a lot were also being discussed. The same goes on uh, the influx of foreigners and the economy. What kind of economy that Singapore aspire to have? Is it more towards semi-skilled workers or more towards uh, business-centric, where they want to, they would be employ more skilled workers? In this sense, it makes more sense that um, gov- uh, that the government would open doors to more foreign. But it will create uncertain uh, sentiments or negative sentiments among the locals. So these are the balancing act that the governments and also those candidates that are fielding uh, in the and the, the upcoming generation uh, elections or general elections would need to consider. So from Singapore, we move on to Thailand. So there's an arrest for the second second important suspect in Bangkok blast probe. Thai police arrested a second foreign suspect in the country's deadliest bombing on Tuesday and said that they believe he played an important role but could not confirm. He was the man seen in a yellow t-shirt leaving a backpack at the scene of the blast. The man also believed to have played a role in a smaller explosion in Bangkok on the day after the bombing at the shrine. Thai police spokesman Prabhut Ta Won Shirin told reporters, from all the evidence that we have, the man arrested was an important member of the group that planted the two bombs in Bangkok. But he couldn't confirm if the arrested man was the chief suspect seen on grainy security footage, dropping off a backpack at the shrine and leaving before the bomb went off. He said the man looked like the chief suspect. So I guess in a way, even though uh, second important suspect in Bangkok are being probed by a, a huge question mark still remain, who is the culprit and how the government can make uh, you know, can be able to solve this um, uh, as soon as possible because people need answer fast. Uh, and on the other hand, we will uh, take a short break. When we return, we'll discuss further on Vietnam, Myanmar, and other ASEAN countries on the political situation there. <laughs> ASEAN Dailies, first and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Good morning. This is back with uh, this is Arlene again. You're back with me at ASEAN Daily. So uh, to continue our news, I want to move on to Vietnam. I bet people out there might not realize yesterday Vietnam marked 70 years since declaring independence from France. Vietnam's president uh, urged further modernization of the armed forces in the face of growing maritime territorial disputes. Uh, this is of, of course in referral towards uh, the South China Sea as the nation celebrated 70 years since it declared independence from France. More than 30,000 people, from soldiers for schoolgirls, um, 
from soldiers to schoolgirls. All of them march in a lavish parade in the capital Hanoi to mark the anniversary of founding President Ho Chi Minh's proclamation of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. His famous September 2nd, 1945 speech, part of which was taken from the U.S. Declaration of Independence, launched a new era of struggle to end nearly a century of French colonial rule and later fight off American intervention and reunify Vietnam. Speaking in the same Badin Square uh, as Ho Chi Minh did it 70 years ago, Vietnam's President Tuong Tan Sang took aim at new global power struggles in the region. Of course, uh, maritime security is one thing, but I think it's important that Vietnamese to realize the significance of uh, the 70 years since Declaration of Independence from France, that Vietnam has, in fact, become a very um, modern country um, uh, an emerging economy. In fact, um, since it opens up it, uh, its economic policy, uh, Vietnam has a very robust startup scene. And at the same time, uh, it's also one of those countries within Southeast Asia that is trying to reform itself to be one of the key uh, leaders in this region. So all the best, Vietnam. On the other hand, as we all know, Myanmar will be having its election uh, in the upcoming um, uh, landmark election in November. So um, what is happening right now is Myanmar body instead rejected Muslim parliamentary candidates, which is like what a thousand steps backwards towards what it promised for a democratic Myanmar. Uh, the news goes, uh, Myanmar's Union Election Commission rejected all but one candidate from an Islamic party based on citizenship requirements before general elections in November in a move that could lead to the party's disbandment. The organization's political leader informed 11 of the rejected candidates are from the Rakhine State and six others are from the Yangon Division. He said, leaving only one party candidate to stand in for election. The rejection notice did not mention detail reasons behind the decision, but just said that the candidates were rejected for violations based on laws and regulations. So it's pretty vague in, uh, in the sense. The DHRP is preparing to appeal the UEC within seven days, although it has not filed yet, says Chomin, a Rohingya candidate who himself was being rejected, although he was a member of the parliament elected in 1990s elections. So there you go. Um, a lot of problems right now happening in Myanmar even before the election, but hopefully things will go on smoothly. And of course, hopefully go, things will go on smoothly with the Myanmar citizens because they will be the one to determine which is the future that Myanmar aspire to go in the for its politics and economic uh, direction. And millions of Myanmar citizens abroad would be missing a chance to change the country towards the betterment of its future. Most of the more than 2 million Myanmar citizens living abroad, whether as uh, working or as a permanent resident, had failed to register for postal voting in November polls. Only about 18,000 of the 2 million people registered as living abroad in November, in the November 2014 census had sent their Applications before the deadline, said Tin A, um, chairman of the Union Election Commission. Without cooperation from them, what else can uh, the Union Election Commission do for them? That's true. I mean, they need to register as soon as possible. And what can the UEC do is to extend the um, the 
the registration date to a date that is closer to the election because in a way that you can accommodate more people to register as voters, especially Myanmar citizens abroad. The commission in fact, criticize parties for declining to help correct alleged inaccuracies in the wider voting list. And uh, from Myanmar, we jumped uh, to Hong Kong. Uh, so, regarding on Hong Kong student protests, Hong Kong, sorry, Hong Kong student protest leaders pleaded not guilty on uh, the. Hong Kong protests that happened a couple of months or last year. An attempt by student protest leader Joshua Wong Chi Fung to hijack his court hearing to air political views earned him a rebuke from the Eastern Magistrates Courts. And Wong, along with two other students, heads of the city's illegal Occupy Central movement last year, as well as six others pleaded not guilty to change to charges stemming from the months long occupation of key roads in Hong Kong. He was abruptly cut off by Principal Magistrate Bina Chen Rai after an attempt to shout slogans uh, justifying his trespass upon government property with Chen Rai warning the 18-year-old student leader, don't use the court to make a political statement. So there's a gap between uh, the students and the people within the institutions, uh, in this case the court. And the second time Chen Rai had warned the accused in her court is the last time she reprimanded a Wong for a similar conduct in July. Scholarism hate Wong 18 pleaded not guilty to inciting others to take part in the unlawful assembly and taking part in the and uh, the same goes with law kun chung 22 denying uh, inciting others to take part in the unlawful assembly uh, the court appearance followed follows the trio arrest last week when a defiant Wong said he trespassed upon government pros- property which sparked months of protest was his best decision in the last four years. So the students are really determined to go against the government in this case. They are really serious about their cause and, and, and I think uh, Hong Kong uh, government needs to listen to the voices of the youth and not just to simply uh, ignore them completely. On the other hand, talking about listening, ASEAN government should consider incentives for flexible employment arrangements. ASEAN government should consider giving further incentives for expenses incurred by employer employers in implementing flexible employment arrangements, say Deputy Human Resource Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Abdul Muttalib. And uh, he said that this was to encourage more companies to adopt flexible employment arrangement. And if adopted by ASEAN member state, it will give workers far greater leeway in terms of the time where they begin and end work, provided they put in the total hours required by the employer. Of course, it's a great uh, suggestion uh, during the ASEAN seminar on balancing flexibility and security and security labor market here. But on the other hand, it's also important to ensure that the, the workers are not being exploited um, uh, you, with the implementation of the flexible employment arrangement. And it's not in said that uh, the flexible employment arrangement were expected to become an important element of human resource strategy of company as work-life balance becomes a rising concern of the workforce, especially among the new generation. Hence, it's important for local companies to seriously consider implementing uh, this arrangement in order to effectively meet their objective of attracting, motivating and retaining talents, in particular the skilled labour. He suggested employers to look at various forms of flexible employment arrangement, including job sharing among employees, working from home, part-time work system, compressed work hours and flexi time. These are great suggestions again. 
uh, it, there's two uh, there's two sides of this. It's important to also see the worker side of it. Uh, of course, you want flexible out uh, flexible hours. You want companies to be able to be more innovative in the way they deliver their productivity. But you also want the workers to have uh, the kind of welfare that they are being they they are supposed to have. We'll take a short break. When we return, we will discuss on the economic side of Southeast Asia. ASEAN Dailies First and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, good morning. You're back with me again, Arlene. So, on the economic side, Thailand approves 3.8 billion US dollar stimulus to help stumbling economy. Actually, the whole of Southeast Asia is facing a low down in terms of their economic uh, progress and Thailand's military government has approved economic measures worth a combined 136 billion baht uh, aimed at boosting spending power in rural areas as the junta struggles to lift its economic growth uh, the measure including self loans via village funds worth 60 billion baht and a budget of 36 billion baht for sub districts uh, Deputy Finance Minister Wisut uh, Sri Supan told reporters the government will also speed up spending on smaller projects with uh, 40 billion baht. Southeast Asia's second largest economy has yet to regain traction after the army seized power in May 2014 to end months of political unrest with exports and domestic demand stubbornly sluggish. Low commodity prices have cut farmers' earning while record high household debt has curbed consumption. On the other hand, economists cut forecasts for Singapore's growth this year. Economists pull in a quarterly survey by the Monetary Authority of Singapore say that they expect Singapore's economy to grow 2.2% this year, down from their previous forecast of 2.7%. Private sector economies are less upbeat about the growth outlook for the Singapore economy this year and have moderated their growth expectations for several sectors. According to a quarterly survey released by the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and the economies poll in the survey say they expect Singapore's economy to grow by 2.2% this year, down from their median forecast. 2.7% in the previous survey in June. So there you go. So they are forecasting for Singapore's growth uh, for this year. Hopefully, the forecast will become a reality. We are going to move on to the social cultural news. So Indonesia picked as the favorite ASEAN destination for travel fair. If you fancy going on a holiday to a place with beautiful beaches, cultural diversity and heritage, then consider Indonesia as your next destination. The number one tourist arrival in ASEAN countries are those from other ASEAN countries. In Malaysia, surprisingly, 75% of tourist arrivals are from ASEAN countries. And this is um, according that, uh, to Hamza, uh, where he said that uh, inter-ASEAN traveling was important, but more needed to be done to achieve the target. And Indonesia Director of, of Promotion for ASEAN Regional Rizky Handayana, uh, sorry, Handayani said that the potential for Malaysia as a partner and source of tourists was big. Last year, they had almost 1.3 million Malaysians visiting Indonesia. There's a lot of Malaysians there <laughs> in Indonesia. Well, this year they are targeting at least 1.7 million Malaysian tourists, according to Risky. So, yeah, if you want to go to any other country in the world, go to Indonesia. And what's great about Indonesia is so diverse, it's so huge. You can go uh, to Sumatra, you can go to uh, the Jawa Islands, to Bali, and to other 
areas uh, that you might not, you know, always hear about. For example, Papua or Sulawesi and all that. But all the areas in Indonesia are really beautiful and really, um, they really have one of the best hospitality in Southeast Asia. On the other hand, ah, do you know Putin is actually in Beijing for China's V-Day Parade? Believe it or not, Putin is uh, trying to have closer relationship with China as he arrived, Vladimir Putin, on Wednesday afternoon in Beijing to watch China's military parade that marks the 70th anniversary of the victory of the Chinese People's War of Resistance against Japanese aggression and the world's anti-fascist war. And Russian President uh, said, uh, arrive uh and 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 dispatches also 93 soldiers to take part in the parade scheduled on Thursday, which is today. Previously, a Chinese military formation participated in the 2015 Moscow Victory Day Parade at the Red Square, and this time, the Russian formation will be the last to march across the Tiananmen Square. In an earlier interview, he said that, or Putin said that. Celebration of the V-Day parade by Russia and China demonstrated the two countries have really close friendship and unshakable efforts in defending the historical truth, quote unquote, and the fruits of victory. And he will be meeting his Chinese counterpart during the visit, the third one within the year. During the meeting, both head of states will hold talks on different levels and witness the signing of over 20 cooperative agreements in multiple areas covering finance, transportation and energy. So that's all from me today. Hopefully you enjoy our ASEAN Daily and we will definitely bring you the latest news from Southeast Asia and of course Asia, Pacific and the world uh, tomorrow. And the day after tomorrow, we have it on Monday to Friday, 8 to 9 o'clock, uh, Malaysian time, of course. And of course, don't forget to listen to us on the go, uh, at, uh, your, via your mobile by downloading our Duran ASEAN app, app. You can always go to our website to get more information about our news, uh, our other projects on videos and also podcasts. And you can also keep tap with us via our social media. We are quite active in Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. There you go. This is me, Ireland, signing off.